Thank you very much for having me and thank you to Imam Rashid for uh, inviting me here and good afternoon to you all. Uh, for the last week, three notable things have happened. Um, over the last week, we've all witnessed when you go into any of the supermarkets how you have to queue up alongside thousands of parents who are scrambling to buy stationery for their children. That's if you're not a parent yourself buying stationery for your children. At the same time, the matric exam results came out and it always causes trepidation because we don't know what the outcome will be. What we do know is that fewer than a third of the people who enter at grade one reach and happen to pass grade 12. So there's an enormous social crisis in education. But just this morning, the third event was leading the business day. And a few companies have just declared record dividends. One of them is Kuro Holdings. They are the suppliers of private education. In some sense, these appear to be three completely different things. But they're actually one thing fueling another. The same crisis in education that makes our children fail, that makes them fail to get through the system, or fail to get quality education, fuels the capabilities of companies who then provide education at a price, and they achieve record profits as a result of achieving that price. In other words, as they say, one man's meat is another man's poison. As one lot of things affect us, somebody else benefits from it. And the results are sometimes there for all to see. Now when that happens, as we know, all of us are faced often with moral dilemmas. Because we, we're social people, we, we're caring people. And when we witness these kinds of catastrophes, it's very difficult to think in broad social terms because our first instinct is, what about my family and my own kids? And how can I ensure the best for them? I can't solve the world's problems but I can at least ensure that my kids get on in life. And so when uh, public health care, public hospitals either close or are overcrowded, then we obviously clamor for medical aid, so that allows us to go to private hospitals and in some sense, pay our way out of the problems in the system. <coughs> and in the case of education, we scrimp, save, borrow, do whatever is necessary to ensure that our children can get out of the lot. And then we can feel as parents, as caring human beings, we've made a difference. That's the sort of backdrop that, in a way, the moral lesson to us all is when things are so bad, the way out is somehow, through some sense of personal sacrifice, we can individually find a way to beat the system. And I'm not pointing fingers at anybody because it's a dilemma facing each and everyone, including myself. So when the fees must fall movement emerged initially in 2015 at UCT as a slide against the lower statue, and subsequently at all the other campuses in the country, it's a little bit something that's difficult to take on board because so much sacrifice has been made on our part, and here this seems to be threatening those sacrifices. Many, in many instances, it's our children, therefore, who may not get a tertiary education because things have been discussed. Now, I'm going to try and take us through the possibilities, instead of seeing this in a fearsome manner, of seeing all of these developments in a positive manner, as a source of inspiration rather than a source for fear. Originally, I'm aware that the person that was going to be speaking on this topic was herself a leader in the student movement, Shaila Khan, but unfortunately she couldn't make it. And I would not presume to speak on behalf of the students. I, like you, I'm a parent, an observer, a citizen, an activist, somebody who cares about these developments, 
but I'm not personally involved in the decisions that students may or may not take. But I think there are important lessons that I think they've taught us all and I'd like to dwell on those lessons. And I think there are three. I'm going to start with the one that's probably easiest to, to talk about, and then I'm going to deal increasingly with ones that are increasingly more difficult. The first one is that instead of possibly regarding problems in our lives as our individual problems that we can try and deal with through personal sacrifice in our own families and our own lives in order to improve things for our children and our immediate people that we care for. Maybe it's beginning to be a time again when we must embrace these things as social problems and that we need as a collective to mobilize socially to address what are social and ultimately political problems. Why do people have to queue up at supermarkets to pay for station when education should be a right? And education is not just what happens in buildings, but all the resources for education should be free, should be available to each and every human being without having to enter the market and pay for it. Because when that happens, those who can afford to do that, those who can't, can't do that. And those who can do that at enormous sacrifice so that they do without food, they do without other human necessities in order to pay for the necessary station. What I think the first lesson that we've got from the student movement over the last two years, in all its ugliness and robustiousness and anger and, and so on, is that when you organize as a collective, when you mobilize, when you address something as a political problem, for the first time the possibility exists that we can turn what appears to be an individual problem into a social problem <coughs> as a collective. I want to just dwell on one instance, it's a very crude instance of what I regard as something that the, the student movement has actually already achieved. In the course of the medium term expenditure budget announced by Praveen Gordon in September last year, they agreed an extra 9 billion rand was going to be available for tertiary education. At the beginning of the year, in the original budget, a further 18 billion rand was already set aside. Now, this was despite the fact that we are told that there's no money. <coughs> Under this kind of public pressure, they found some money. I like to think that social mobilization beats economics any day of the week. That when one stands together, mobilizes, makes a noise, mobilizes the community, <laughs> changes public opinion, it is possible to change something. The students will tell me, but that's not what we wanted, we wanted free education. Yes, of course. But you've taken a step towards that by challenging the economic consensus in our country. Yeah, that's an important lesson for us. And that helps us, that helps us begin to believe that it is possible to do something about it. That we can possibly say, how come the only way you begin to have your streets swept in your communities is if you form a city improvement district and you have to pay extra for that. It doesn't come out of your taxes, you have to pay extra for that. How come in our community we can't mobilize to say street cleaning is a right? And we need to mobilize to ensure that that can be done without extra pay. I think that's an important lesson that the student has, has taught us. And insofar as it's clear that none of these figures has addressed the two core demands, namely free education and what they call decolonized education. We can anticipate that in 2017, and as I say, I'm not a student activist myself, so I'm not on the inside, but we can anticipate that those struggles will resume again on an ongoing basis. So we cannot draw comfort again as older people that Finally, when the holidays are that's over, and maybe things will get down to normal. It won't. We know that. And when things don't get down to normal, it offers you a choice. 
can you help to ensure that some victories can be won or will we join those within public opinion that merely condemn us? It doesn't look at the possibilities of how this can help all of us to change the world the way the world is seen, what I call the economic consensus, not only in our country but in the world, that says things only have value if you pay for them. Which takes me to the second point. When the students call for free education, I think that they come up with something so important that is worth dwelling at length on. Because there were, quite, there were quite a few voices that said, but nothing actually is free. How can anything be free? It's absurd. And the problem is that we're being seduced by language into conflicting different things. I think everybody will agree that nothing comes for nothing. In other words, you've got to put effort into things to ensure that they happen. I think we would also love to accept that education should involve hard work. That you shouldn't just pass. We would like people who have skills to pass on their skills in the community, that they are appropriately qualified to do that. And appropriate qualifications implies that they have worked hard and applied themselves to succeed. But that is not the same as plus. <coughs> and that's why I'm saying I want to dwell a little bit on this notion that price, monetary, commercial value, equates valuing and effort. Because if we can delink these, then possibly we can make progress. Now, it's interesting because, actually, and I'm speaking here to the faith community, Within the faith community, some of the important moments in the history of various faith communities came precisely around this question of attaching a monetary value to something that was socially and in doctrinal terms important. In Christendom, one of the defining moments that split Christendom was the idea that the clergy required a tithe from people, payment if you wanted to enjoy the blessings of the clergy. And groups of the clergy broke with orthodox clergy around that question that the blessings should be free. Not because people didn't regard the blessings as important and something to be striven for, but they shouldn't attract a monetary value for that. And that's, that's very deep in, in, in that tradition. I know in the, in, the, in the particular faith community that I'm addressing here that the question of usury is forbidden. Because the notion that the act of giving to somebody who needs has to be paid for in the form of interest is forbidden. It's regarded as sinful. In other words, the act of lending should be an act of sharing and not an act of using. It should be free. Now if we can take that on board in our souls, in our hearts, why can't we take on board that the education of our children in all its manifestation should be free? It's of the same order I would argue, and I hope you forgive me if I'm sounding like I'm dwelling into territories that's not my period of Free in the sense that we are using this term implies it is a public good. It's the responsibility of the public as a collective to use the public's resources to make sure that these resources are available for everybody. In other words, that education is a public good. It should come out of public resources and it should be used for the benefit of the public. Put in that way, it is absolutely clear that the notion of charging for education should move us to anger, should make us feel that we are abusing a very noble concept by putting a price on it. I'm saying that because in shocking terms, one of the big social crises facing us at the moment is prices of global warming. The fact that forests are being denuded, the fact that oceans are being polluted, and that is producing more greenhouse gases that's clouding atmosphere and increasing the respect. The World Bank has come up with this solution. 
It says the reason we don't appreciate the ocean and forests is because they are free. So if we can attach a price to forests and the ocean, then we will appreciate it and then we won't abuse forests and the sea. This is what's coming out of economists in the World Bank. This is the biggest lending institution in the world. I think most of us would find that deeply offensive that we should take the seat and attach a price to it. But don't be surprised that if in time that were to happen and become law, then we would also say that you can't expect the seat to be free, otherwise we don't expect it. The price of it. That's what we've done with the education. And the students, I think, by their actions, have shown us and done us all in the most favor of charity. <coughs> The second thing that students, third thing, sorry, that students have done is this notion of what they call decolonized education. Now it's something that has lent itself to caricature. You know, somebody said, oh, we mustn't do science and mathematics, but that's wasted. We must, we must throw it away. And then it's easy to laugh, it sounds absurd. But let's dwell on this matter a little bit more. Is science Western? What is Western? An Indian philosopher called Pankra, Pankaraj Mishra has demonstrated that this notion of the West first came into being in the 20th century in the context of the Cold War. So in the context of the Cold War, the United States, which happens to be on the west of the British the Meridian, going through, through Greenwich Village, is West. It left out the fact that Latin America is also on the West, but they don't include that. And then they invented the term Western civilization, Western science, Western whatever. Human knowledge has come from every part of it. In mathematics, which is my formal, those of you who remember me as a teacher, my formal uh, qualification, one of the biggest moments in the history and the evolution of mathematics was the invention of the symbol zero. Where did that come from? That came from the Arabs. The people who are today seen as part of the Iran era invented the term which mathematicians before that didn't know existed or didn't conceive of as existing. And so we can go on to every aspect of human knowledge. It has come from China, from Africa, from the Incas, from the Middle East, from across various faith groups and scientific groupings everywhere. The notion that it's Western is absurd. So we don't have to apologize for saying we want decolonized education. But that doesn't mean we now are going to look for some mythical African source of science. It's not the same. All we're saying is here is an opportunity to reimagine how human knowledge can improve. If we take away these boundaries, these artificial boundaries that divide people along lines, nation, state, and so on, and public resources are available across all spaces in the world, then we will get the best of human knowledge from wherever it derives. That is the possibilities of the Now I'm aware that I'm making it sound more good. As you sit here, there might be many things you can think of. These are the bad things that I'm giving out. But like everything, it depends on where we stand on this matter. Left to their own devices, if public opinion turns against the student movement in the next few years, then like anything, it can wither and turn inwards. If there's no support in your own home, for your children, the people involved, in the community, if there's no discussion of the meanings of this term of free and decolonization and so on, then people often turn in themselves, and instead of this being a movement for a new form of social justice, it can become something else. So my appeal is let's not be scared that what's been raised by the student movement is in some sense something to make us all feel either anger, resentment, or fear. If we can embrace these, we can also criticize things that the student movement has done. We can possibly say to them, you actually have won victories, and when you win victories, 
sometimes you can temporarily arrest and say, well, let's take this victory so long and work on and prepare for a new round. It's possible. But you can only say that if you are part of the movement. And it's not a movement that would require everybody to leave their homes and go to the campuses and so on. Because we've always learned, those of us who've been through these past struggles, that struggles like charity begins at home. It's how you discuss and you share these things in your house that makes it possible to change public opinion. Because public opinion is not something out there. It's not other people, it's us. It's, we are the public. If we can be reflecting on these things, challenging these things in our home, we have the possibility of changing the public. Now, where does that leave us? I'm saying a number of critical things about the notion of free, about the notion of decolonization, and about the notion of organizing. <coughs> if, we look, if we leave aside education for a moment, but we take every aspect that challenges our lives, from health, from the state of our streets, from the state of public transport, from the price of things, from the fear that we have that our children might be involved in drugs and also to the antisocial thing. We know we can only address these things if we work as communities. If we take these as individual problems, the chances of ever making any progress are zero. And if we've learned something from the student movement, then maybe it's time to revive our tradition of working as communities and as organized people and as people who are thinking, believing, and coming to work. So I'd like to leave you with those words, and I'd like to salute the fact that you have granted me in your patient way, in the middle of your devotion, an opportunity to listen to somebody ramble in this way about seeing the possibilities of the student movement as a source of inspiration. Thank you very much.